after the APOA logo, you're in. So it's it's of 5 p.m. Would you like to start, Professor John? Hello. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Prof, Welcome to APO. We are still in practice. We are still in practice. Mm -hmm. So okay. would you like to I think we need to start? start. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let us start with the video and then you can start your opening remarks uh, when you see the APOA logo. Okay. Okay, uh, okay everybody, let's enjoy the show. Mm -hmm. Play the video, please. Recording in progress. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to APOA 11th webinar. This is Professor In ho -jun and president of APOA Hand and Upper Limb Society. I'm so delighted to have 13 more experts from all over the world to have the uh, special webinar about the arthritis of the hand and wrist, elbow and shoulder. At the end of this talk, you will have a very comprehensive knowledge and information which you can use for your clinical practice. And once again, thank you very much for your coming and welcome you all. So before, to avoid any further delay, I would like to introduce our first session, hand and wrist, Dr. Che, who is going to uh, moderate the first session. Dr. Che, over to you. <coughs> Thank you, Professor, for the kind uh, introduction. So I'm Dr. Wing Lin Che from Hong Kong. Um, I'm going to moderate uh, this session with our uh, dear commentator, uh, Dr. Sumit Tawaka who is a senior fellow in upper limb surgery at Whitington Hospital. So <clears throat> may I introduce the, our um, first speaker, who is uh, Professor Guillaume Hersfer. He's an uh, expert in the total risk replacement. He's a professor of public surgery in Lyon, France. He's a black clinic and road clinic in Lyon, France. He's an author of more than... 500 scientific publications, active member of the European Society of the Shoulder and Elbow, the French Society of Arthroscopy. He's a past president of the French Society of Hand Surgery and European Wrist Arthroscopy Society. He's co-director of the IWIW um, International Wrist uh, Investigators Workshop. Uh, he organized a famous Lyon uh, International Wrist uh, meeting every year since uh, 2005. Uh, there are also another two speakers uh, um, um, who is going to um, um, talk with uh, Dr. Um, Dylan Hesper, uh, <laughs> partner, Dr. Uh, Marion Bernier, is the hand and upper limb surgeon at the Institute of Surgery de la Mont, uh, in uh, Lyon, France, and also the third one, um, Professor Michel uh, Postris, who is the uh, assistant editor of the journal Risk Surgery and is the president of the F, uh, FESH, FESSH Congress uh, in Copenhagen 2018, and uh, future president of the 
uh, SSSH. And he's a current consultant hand surgeon at the uh, Papio Private Hospital in Denmark. <coughs> and so we are so delighted um, to have uh, their talk uh, about the total risk um, replacement indications and outcome. Uh, I'll feed their professors, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Marion Gournier. Leo Merzberg. Michel Buxtas, uh, who is uh, with us. Uh, I, I found the presentation of <coughs> Marion was rather empty. She has more than 300, 300 papers as well. So we are relaxed and it's, it's, it's nice. Uh, thank you, Professor Jeon. Thank you, uh, Esther Show. Um, Win Ling says it's, it's great to, to hear from you and, uh, and uh, to present uh, this, uh, uh, this work uh, in front of such a prestigious uh, 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 audience. So we are very happy. Marion, do you, you want to say yes, a word? Thank you again. Thank you, Guillaume, for uh, letting me uh, speak uh, with you and Michel. It was a great pleasure to work uh, on arthroplasty uh, since now many years. And uh, I am very pleased to be here with uh, you, my dear colleagues. And uh, I think uh, it is a very challenging topic. And so we will try to uh, put some uh, insight in uh, the uh, total risk of arthroplasty in 2023. Uh, Michel, do you want to say an introduction word? Oh, I would like to say thank you very much for uh, having me uh, in your talk, uh, Guillaume, and, and thank you very much, organizers, for uh, letting me do that. Thank you. It's not my talk, Michel. We met in uh, 2009 in Poznan, and since uh, then we always worked together and now with Mario as well. So, uh, you have the title, and uh, Mario, please, the, the outline. So, this is the outline. We will follow first, of course, indications on the results, and then we will uh, pay attention to the complications of uh, both the, the, uh, the current implants. We will see that there are several, unfortunately, and the perspective to improve uh, those outcomes. But first of all, Guillaume, we have to, to divide two kinds of uh, patients uh, for these arthroplasties. We should never, ever forget that these are different patients, the rheumatoids and the non-rheumatoids. In many series and many papers, they are mixed together, and it's not a good idea. Uh, you see, the, the, this is the introductory uh, work. Yes. And yes, to remind that there is the low demand patient and uh, those indications, of course, are decreasing with dermatoid arthritis, with the, the new treatment, medical treatment. And on the other, other side, the non-rheumatoid patient who, of course, have higher functional needs and there are some increasing indications for those patients. We know that for severely destroyed risk, there are several uh, options, uh, surgical options. And of course, here we will speak about prosthetic total arthroplasty, arthroplasty or spacer. And it's a difficult talk, a difficult uh, challenge, because th there is a winner. And the winner is the fusion, because many, many, many surgeons think uh, that it's good to have a fusion and it's, it's, it's a stable wrist and uh, that uh, there is nothing else than a fusion when uh, there is a total wrist destruction. Yes, of course, uh, Guillaume, but we know that patients and all of us actually we prefer motion, wrist motion if we can. And we know that uh, there is this functional wrist motion from Palmer many years ago and there is about 30 degrees of extension. So, and also because in some patients, especially in rheumatoid, uh, they of course have uh, usually both risks affected. So what about both uh, total risk arthrodesis? So we need some motion. And it can really change your life if you have 30 degrees of risk extension to facilitate uh, the making a fist. But the uh, mechanical axis and the biomechanics of the wrist is not so easy. We know a lot uh, since some years about the dart throwing motion, and it's not so easy to reproduce uh, this kind of axis of the wrist to uh, achieve uh, uh, the, the best, uh, I mean, motion of both the inflection extension or in deviation. And uh, this is the true life. So what do you do with that? 
such a viral subluxation that we're able to, uh, I mean, to put uh, total risk arthroplasty safely uh, in this kind of patient. And because this challenge was so uh, high, so difficult, this is why the first generations uh, had a high, high uh, complication rate. And, and Dr. Takwa Kalk, who is working with the Yan Trail, uh, it was very instrumental in this uh, in this uh, amount of data, showing that it was not possible at all to uh, go on with those first designs of uh, implants. Yes, and uh, from those first designs, we know this is not a forgiving procedure because once it failed, I mean, it is it is very difficult to fix it again. Of course, you can go to arthrodesis, but you need a big graft. You need, uh, I mean, uh, to um, to replace to replace uh, the first carbo and to it's not so easy to achieve fusion when uh, it failed and uh, there in 2003 at four years there was an unacceptable revision rate so we, you may have transformed the situation of an easy uh, arthrodesis to a difficult arthrodesis but, but just because you tried a, a new design of prosthesis and that's why we have seen so many new generation of total risk arthroplasty from the unit to the remotion and then more recently the motec or the pyrocarbon with the amandus it's impossible to have experience with all all implants at, at the large scale. Uh, we have to quote also the very interesting uh, trial of uh, Shannon Shen to, to use custom-made implants because the volumes are very low, so for industry it might be a good solution. And we will talk mainly about the remotion, which is the one we know the best. And the great study you've made with uh, Michel uh, some years uh, ago. And this is a metal and poly uh, prosthesis, which is different from the metal and metal or metal and pick from the Motec or the pyrocarbon. So maybe, uh, Marion, can we stop a little bit on this slide? Because you have here gathered the three, four types of current available implants. You have the universal, which is now called the freedom. There was a uni one, uni two, and now it's a freedom. You have, of course, the remotion. You have the MOTEC, which is uh, from uh, Norway, from uh, Oli Reichstadt, and the pyrocarbon, which is not per se in um, a total risk, but which is uh, the equivalent and uh, the spacer. And it has to be taken in consideration. And considering the remotion that we will uh, speak more about today, uh, this is an implant with a 10 degree rotation within the carpal component uh, and with a stable ellipsoid surfaces, uh, which uh, achieve to no conflicts between uh, the, the radial and the carpal uh, part of the implant. And you see the stability is very good. You see this slide at the bottom where the, 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 the implant is stable. It's just uh, put into some uh, hard paper and it, it's uh, stable in itself. So it's, it's, uh, it's was uh, an interesting feature. The surgical technique here? It's, uh, uh, it's uh, rather straightforward. This is the end of the procedure, of course, where you, you just have to relocate. It looks very easy like it. We have to say that this is not, I mean, like every uh, surgical procedure, especially uh, arthroplasty, you have to uh, plan uh, your surgery, of course, to check your implants, and there is a specific steps. This is not the topic today. First of all, it was not the topic. And please, Michel, uh, uh, um, say something. If you if you want to add something, just feel free to to take the the the. the, the to talk. What, what do you think about the learning curve, uh, Michel, for this uh, total risk arthroplasty? Maybe some more about that? I think the, there is a steep learning curve. And when you start doing that, I think you should uh, engage with a colleague that has uh, experience. I did that. My first many cases were together with uh, Christa Solomon from uh, Gothenburg, who had experience, and that is very important. Okay, thank you. And um, please, Michel. Y yes, many of our data are based on this uh, registry that we created in 2009, where we collected uh, cases on the remotion arthroplasty from uh, international centers. And today, uh, could I have the next one? 
Yes, today this registry uh, has, has been extended to other arthroplasties as well. But among the 524 uh, arthroplasties, we have 385 primary remotion arthroplasties. And of these, we have 207 that have a, a follow-up of at least five years. So we have a quite good experience to make analyses. Yes, and congratulations for this work because uh, I mean this is mandatory to have such a bigger history uh, to see the outcomes, to make some conclusions, and to improve these arthroplasties. So th this is really amazing. Congratulations, Michel. Yes, you should be commended for that. And uh, we put that together uh, in 2012. It was well received at the uh, American Society for Surgery of the Hand. And um, but we were careful enough in uh, in our conclusions. We saw that the clinically, because the the remotion database was mainly clinical, we saw that uh, the pain improvement was fantastic. That the quick dash as well. That. Uh, the grim stress was also, of course, uh, improved uh, with a, a significantly higher grip strength in the uh, rheumatoid compared to the non-rheumatoid uh, group, which is interesting. Regarding motion, we were so happy to see that we got this uh, vertically active extension to uh, facilitate uh, re uh, the fist, so it was great. But, Michel, you warned us very early about that. Please. Yeah, I think this is a, an interesting study we did on a, a high number of patients where we compared the preoperative motion of patients rheumatoid and not rheumatoid with the post-op at two years. And we can see um, that there is a correlation between the pre-op and the post-op mobility. Uh, if a patient has poor mobility preoperatively, it will be poor at the end also. And conversely, a good motion will lead to a good motion after arthroplasty. And this is important because we have to inform the patients that they should not expect a, an improvement in mobility. We do not operate to improve mobility. We operate with these arthroplasties to maintain mobility. And if the mobility is poor, my attitude is do not use an arthroplasty. It will be a very expensive uh, arthrodesis at the end. Yes, thank you very much, Michel, for pointing that out. And it is, as you said, very important for the indication, but also which is very interesting is you do not increase the range of motion, but you can deplace it. And this is very interesting and useful. For example, uh, I mean, I learned that from Guillaume and you, huh? but uh, if you have a patient with uh, like zero degree of extension, but like 45 degrees of friction, you can still perform a total risk because, because you can deplace, displace the, the range of motion, for example, between zero and 45 degrees of extension, which is, of course, as we all know, much more useful than the 45 degrees of friction. So this is very, very useful for the, the indications. So analysis from database, clinical, and next, what are the complications? The complications at the beginning seems to be rather comparable to other uh, implants. And uh, I'm sure that Michel wants to add, add something about that. Yeah, that's an ana a recent analysis of the database. And it shows that infection, lux uh, instability, luxation, algodystrophy are very rare complications. We do not worry. Carpal tunnel syndrome. Yes, it happens uh, uh, and in our material, 4%. But the interesting thing is, of course, the revision and the durability of the implant. Uh, we have, at a certain time, a revision rate of 11%, but revision rate in itself is not very informative because it depends on the observation time. The longer the follow-up, the higher the revision rate, of course. So I will come back later and show the, uh, the survival rates. That is more informative, I would say. And then there is the very important issue of the periprosthetic osteolysis. This has been puzzling. 
uh, we analyzed it in the remotion at a very early stage. And now it shows that other implants also have this problem and also other joints. Thank you. So, so clinical, it's good. Clinically, it's good. A few or acceptable rate of complications. It's it's fantastic. It's a winner. We we got the we, we got the solution. Let's uh, and, add and, to some. Uh, and Marion, look, let's uh, let's have a look at this rheumatoid man. It's rare to have a rheumatoid man who was so happy uh, at three years with this implant. It's it's really it's a, it's a clinical uh, situation. It's a clinical very good example. And look at this other one. 41, 44, young lady. Yes, with rheumatoid arthritis, lady we used to see, unfortunately, with the, the this kind of uh, destroyed wrist with the rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, actually, on the sagittal view, the axis was not so bad, but uh, still a challenging one. And very and very poor, poor function. You can see the lion wrist score, which is taking into consideration both the pronunciation, inflection, extension, and the, and also the subjective wrist value from the patient was 19 out of 100 before the surgery. And you can see that it was uh, significantly improved after the surgery. And with a rather good follow-up, both clinically and also radiographically, uh, despite uh, this uh, price for prosthetic osteoarthritis. And we are at 10 years follow-up here. Fantastic. Yes. Another one who is uh, fantastic. By that role. This is what we discussed at the beginning of, uh, of this uh, presentation. When you have the both wrist, how can you guess you will feel better with the both arthritis? One more. Also in non-rheumatoid patients, it's much more selective, but you have some non-rheumatoid patients in whom uh, total risk of prophecy can be a win-win uh, uh, solution. Yes, Mario, but he was an old guy. He was okay to uh, use uh, a very uh, Moderate. uh, moderately his, mm -hmm. his wrist, and he was very compliant. Yeah. And this is why we used to say that uh, uh, this is not for non-rheumatoid patient. Total risk of prophecy is not a good indication uh, in, in those uh, in those cases. So, in those situations, young, middle aged heavy manual worker, or of course poor addicted, uh, you have to prefer uh, total risk fusion. So we just showed you clinically a good result, statistically a good result. Number two. Uh, acceptable complication rates and nice examples. So life is good. Next, please. We are, we are very careful to, Michel, you remember, we said there are web limitations. It was too heavy to, to put the, the x-rays and to have a careful analysis. But we were somewhat uh, anxious about uh, the survival. And now I'm sure you, you want to say something about the uh, survival rates. Yeah, this is uh, the, uh, the cumulated survival rate of the remotion at 10 to 12 years. And it shows a survival rate of 82%. Um, this is comparable to uh, other uh, implants that have a, a long uh, uh, observation time. And uh, next side piece, uh, Guillaume. This confirms what we have said before. The high demand patients, this, in this analysis, we defined high demand as non-rheumatoid arthritis younger than 60 years versus low demand that are patients with rheumatoid arthritis and uh, older than 55 years, you see, 65. You see that there is a clear difference and significant difference in survival rate uh, between these groups. And just to remind you, uh, this is the uh, survival rates of proximal row carpectomy and four corn arthrodesis. These survival rates are also about 80% at, uh, at uh, 8, 10, 15 years. So uh, don't believe that uh, proximal row carpectomy or four corn arthrodesis are um, always a success. But of course, if you have the possibility to do this, uh, uh, in uh, procedures, you should do it and not consider uh, total wrist art arthroplasty until uh, the failure of these procedures. 
Thank you, Michel, for highlighting this. It, it's uh, it's uh, not very frequent to see this uh, this slide. Yes, because we are used to be uh, very severe with the total risk, uh, our toplessly outcomes and complications, and we have, it's very important, and thank you, yes, right, thank you to remind us about that. We used to forget that and to think that it's uh, all a win uh, procedure, but uh, PRC or four corner, but there is also, uh, I mean, a significant rate of, uh, of conversion, so it's very important to remind that uh, also those procedures have some complications. Now we have uh, acceptable survival rates plus what we said before, but there was something that the database dis didn't address properly, which is uh, uh, periprosthetic osteolysis. You see the data were acceptable, but uh, Michel and, and, and we saw uh, very, very uh, concerning uh, periprosthetic osteolysis. So we decided we didn't know, know the cause and we decided to have a focus. Uh, remember, Marion, we spent hours in the screening uh, the, the slides and uh, putting together the millimeter of osteolysis. And this was our conclusion. So, and about 44 uh, remotion with an average follow up of four years. Uh, you can see that uh, there was in 56% uh, no osteolysis and in about 30% a periprosthetic osteolysis without uh, loosening. So it was a very important information considering, uh, uh, of course, those results of plasty and those follow up and what to do uh, with the patient. And Michel brought another interesting addition. Yes, this shows uh, about the same what uh, you said. This is the development of the um, uh, the osteolysis on the radial side uh, in function of time. You see most of them stay between two millimeter and, and nothing happens. A few uh, increase during the first two, three years and then stabilize. And very few uh, increase rapidly. And uh, we don't exactly know what will happen there. Uh, they may uh, loosen or they may stay stable for some more years. But about five, four, five percent develop an important uh, osteolysis. That may be a concern. Thank you, Michel. So the next step is to focus on complications, but not only uh, on complications of the remotion, it would be unfair. We will, we will focus on complications, and this is our second part of the talk, complications of all the four uh, implants. Acute, it's okay, it's a safe procedure, there is no problem at the acute stage, it's not a, a very dangerous procedure, but it's interesting to compare the complication between the three, the four uh, main types of implants that we highlighted at the beginning of, of, of the of the talk. So first, uh, we said that it was about the metal uh, unpoly implant with the unit two uh, on the remotion, metal and metal for the motec and pyrocarbon. The unit two first. Many papers, many papers. Uh, this is good. Many papers, not uh, many analyses of uh, periprosthetic osteolysis, but you see here you have one of two which has uh, this osteolysis and with the addition of uh, metallosis cyst. Look at this slide from the Ward uh, paper, Ward and Brian Adams. And uh, you, you see the, the, the large periprosthetic osteolysis. Here, you see around the carpal component, and there is not only the osteolysis, but the shift of uh, the stem and screws. Here, again, periprosthetic osteolysis. And as you mentioned, and uh, show us into your, your table, Michel, it is uh, on the radial side. It's more on the, the, the radial side of the radius, as you can see. Even if the implant looks great, you see the cortical of the second metacarpal has been a little bit uh, modified because of, of the screw, which was unable to go uh, further. This is why... Uh, since the beginning, I defend the idea that uh, it's better to try at least not to cross the CMC joint or to cross a fused CMC joint. Look at this one. 
So what's the cause? Is it stress shielding? Is it poly debris? Michelle will talk uh, more about that later. And uh, we go now to the complications of the remotion, the focus on uh, the periprosthetic osteolysis of the remotion. You can see the, those paper uh, with uh, some favorable follow-up, but uh, there was, and this is the, the, the actually the main numbers we, we find for uh, most of the prosthesis, that about one-third complication and 15% revision. In this paper, it was about only the non-rheumatoid patient. You can see here uh, also, uh, I mean, and, uh, concerning osteolysis and the, mainly on the radial side of the implant. Uh, this is uh, an example of a patient, a rheumatoid a male patient, uh, as you can see here. And at the follow-up, at the beginning, I mean, it was it was it was sorry. It was the the early for radiographic follow up, and here we are at five years. She's doing very well. I mean, uh, great uh, outcomes, uh, Guillaume, but uh, still a concern about the radiographic. So, um, what can we we do with those patients? Follow them carefully, uh, both clin clinically and radiographically. Michelle, a word, please. Well, I make this very brief in the interest of time. But we did we could not be able in biopsies of consecutive patients we could not be able to demonstrate a correlation between the amount of particles and the magnitude of the osteolysis so we could not confirm that the osteolysis is caused by particles metallic or polyethylene but we could not exclude it either okay so now, the MOTEC is the solution because yes. there is no poly. So. Maybe, let's have a look. The metal and metal or metal and peak ah. uh, still osteolysis. There is so still. from what? Uh, you can see uh, their first study in 2017, they uh, didn't report actually osteolysis because they probably didn't look at it. It was mainly about the clinical uh, results. Uh, but then uh, you can see uh, on the picture on the radiographic that uh, there is still uh, osteolysis mainly on the radial side and the implants. And in 2018, they reported metal debris. And this is similar to the carpometacarpal joint and carpometacarpal arthroplasty, uh, for which we know that uh, elevated serum chrome and cobalt clubes had significant, significantly higher dash and pain score. Uh, finally, this is the result from, uh, I mean, the, the, the main uh, conceptor of this arthroplasty. They compare uh, 20 remission and 20 motec, and these are the conclusions. And uh, we have to be very careful with those conclusions because we know now that uh, it's not a problem of metal on metal or metal on polyethylene. It, it, we, we just don't know the reason. It's probably stress shielding. But look at the conclusion of the conceptor of the, the implant, the MOTEC implant. We recommend discontinuing the, the use of metal and metal in TWA, which means, which means discontinuing the, the MOTEC unless you go back to the peak or go back to the metal on poly. So he should be commended to be so honest in his uh, report. Uh, it, it's it's very important, and uh, he he asks more questions than uh, give uh, an answers. So he should be really commended. So now, now a word about the pyrocarbon. Uh, of course, there is a stock preservation. You don't cut the bridge for any other procedure, either fusion or total raised arthroplasty, which can be interesting. This is an example and a case report at seven years follow up. So again, now this is a solution. We found the solution. There is uh, uh, pyrocarbon. This is what we think. And then there was this, this study, still 30%, uh, you know, complications. But if uh, maybe you are more used to the technique, when you see this other study about, I mean, the May team uh, working on this implant, the rate of dislocation is a little bit lower. And this can be, uh, I mean, yeah, we can understand that because it's a more technically uh, demanding procedure to stabilize this, uh, I mean, this balloon, this pyrocarbon uh, implant. So 
uh, biocarbon may be the solution, but may more in, in stable, uh, uh, well-aligned uh, joints with the arthritis. So the perspectives here. Yes, perspectives. So we are now with a much better designs than in the past. And I'm sure Professor Takwoka will, will comment on, on, on that because you published recently on that. Uh, this paper is is a really important recent paper about the the TWA uh, problem and we need uh, i mean a uh, true clinical score clinical evaluation including the rotation of the forearm in our analysis we are sorry because it's uh, the score we, we uh, created and it's it's electronic it's available on on the, uh, our website we are sorry uh, to promote that, but, but it's very important to include the forearm rotation in the analysis of any TWA. Uh, Michel, please, one word about uh, this. Yes, very quickly. The uh, the osteolysis we can see is probably multifactorial, maybe caused by debris particles, but also, next slide, uh, uh, there is a possibility that stress shielding uh, plays an important role. As you know, we have this uh, disappearance, osteolysis of the bone, uh, when we put in an on the head prosthesis, and that is uh, certainly attributed to stress shielding. This may be the same cause, uh, or partly, in uh, total wrist arthroplasty. And it's very difficult to, to have an opinion and to, to have data but because the number of patients is very rare. It's very, uh, 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 there are not many patients. Uh, maybe the solution, and uh, with respect to the industry, is what Shen Shen proposed recently to use uh, uh, custom-made uh, implants. So to summarize what we, we want to say, it's to say, well, if you have a completely destroyed wrist, whether it's uh, rheumatoid or non-rheumatoid, the, the 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 classic and the still working issue is the total risk fusion. But in some patients, selected patient, a uh, specific uh, team, a surgical team, you can prefer total risk arthroplasty, which can lead to better function and satisfaction. And if there is any failure, uh, you can still uh, go to the total risk fusion. Michelle. Yes, and that is an important uh, uh, thing when you make a shared decision about operation with the patient. The patient must know that it all may end with an uh, arthrodesis at, uh, finally. Um, yes, they must, be, uh, they must accept that. So it was uh, our conclusion and summary, and we have to thank you again very much, uh, Marion, Michel, uh, to to have uh, uh, participated to this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and uh, we are ready, and we are pleased to answer to your question and to have some discussion about this topic. Thank we you. Stop sharing the screen. Thank you very much. Very uh, informative uh, talk. Uh, talking about a very, very good balance uh, in the in the introduction of this uh, total wrist replacement technique, uh, the rationale behind, and also the um, fair frank uh, analysis of the the complications and uh, and the potential um, I mean the future directions for further development. Thank you very much. For, I enjoyed this. Uh, I mean, it's the, the best talk I have ever heard about in the total risk replacement because it's uh, very comprehensive and I think it's uh, very informative um, for us to, to um, I mean, to um, to venture into this uh, new technique uh, with very clear uh, understanding. Um, so Thank I think you. I, we, yeah, that thanks very much. So it's been a long time that we haven't been seeing uh, each other. So, um. We have some. Uh, we would like to invite some questions. Um, so, first of all, uh, may I ask? Uh, um, actually, um, there will be patients uh, asking me um, why uh, uh, we have been so sort of more conservative in uh, talking about the um, longevity or the uh, of the this risk impact versus the very good. Uh, outcome for the lower limbs like the hip and knees 
Uh, did you encounter patients asking uh, uh, these questions? And then how you are going uh, to uh, answer the patients about this? It's much easier for a lower limb, lower limb uh, uh, surgery because arthrodesis of the hip has no uh, issue and the arthrodesis of the knee as well. So the, the threshold is, is much higher for, for the wrist. I think um, we must compare this wrist arthroplasty with ankle arthroplasty. We have the same problems, uh, exactly the same problems. But you cannot compare with hip and knees. That's impossible. And the patient, patients must know that. They have always somebody, they know somebody, they have a new hip or a new knee, and it goes very quickly and very perfectly. It's not the same thing when you talk about uh, wrists. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, I my uh, I I usually uh, talk about um, the very different uh, positions and in the terms of the how the joints are being loaded uh, when they are in uh, in function. So the lower limbs maybe um, they are more on under some pressures. They are more being pressed um, to be fixed <laughs> to the bones, and then probably less the problem with the loosening. But for the upper limbs, we are always having uh, forces that try to displace the, or loosen the implant in different directions. We use upper limbs um, in compression, pushing, but also in many times we are pulling. So, I mean, uh, there are a lot of uh, multi-direction force that uh, the patient, the, 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 the implant may be uh, undergoing some stress. So that's, I mean, also the difficulty in the small uh, fixation with the screws, which is... Uh, or stems that is cannot be comparable to the lower limbs, the, the bigger bones. And, and no, but add, you, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, you, we have, uh, as you say, we have pulling and we have pushing, but we have talking, talk, making talk yeah, yes, like yes, that, yes. and that is very important also for the load of the uh, uh, the wrist. Yes, there's also been shown to be the one important factor in the elbow replacement, the talking problem. And we know that the biomechanical axis of the wrist is not so easy to reproduce and to place in the in the correct position with the total wrist implant. And there is also some interesting uh, works and papers, uh, recent papers uh, about this. And uh, also there is so much motion into the wrist compared to the ankle, but we still need, as you already said, uh, a lot of uh, I mean, strength, torque and everything. So it's a combination of very challenging uh, thing, both about motion uh, I mean, uh, axis uh, on the uh, force. The key is probably the distance between all the muscular tendon units and the center of rotation, except the fact that we don't know really where is the center of rotation uh, in different uh, implants. And this is the, there, was, there is an implant that we didn't address at all, but because there is not enough data at this time, it's uh, the Scott Wolf the implant, the kinematics implant. The idea is to uh, more make the center of rotation a little bit more distal and uh, Scott Wolf thinks that it's uh, the, the solution to to improve the, the biomechanics of the total risk. Mm. Thank you. Can I pass the, pass the time to the Dr. Torwalker, uh, the commentator of these sections, uh, to, uh, I mean, have some questions. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here and a fantastic talk, Professor Herzberg. And it's always a pleasure to meet um, uh, Michelle. Um, uh, we, we've been in touch regarding problems that we've had with the universal too as well. So if I could, for the sake of the audience as well, if I could take you back to the basics in terms of everything that you now know, uh, you know, with your extensive experience with wrist replacements, if you were to then choose the perfect patient for a total wrist replacement, as opposed to doing a wrist fusion or a partial wrist fusion, what would that patient be? In whom would you do a total wrist replacement? The reason I ask this question is if you look at some of the contemporaneous literature from 2017 onwards, uh, for example, the MoTeC work, which has been published, they've said that, you know, go ahead and do them in um, patients who are active, who are laborers, and they've got good results. And this was on the back of an 85% survivorship. Now, five years later, the same authors have come up with a paper that say you shouldn't be doing these risk replacements at all. 
So, you know, when you have people, younger surgeons who are now coming up to do these procedures, what message can you give them? Michel, very interesting question. <laughs> well, thank you for the question. Yes, thank you. Yeah, the, um, the perfect patient. That would be an elderly patient not doing uh, um, strenuous sports activity or work activity with a good bone stock and bilateral aff affection. Um, mm. That would be my perfect patient. But I, I, of course, I operate on non-perfect patients as well. They need sure. not to be uh, that old and bilateral, all of them. And your primary indication for these is pain like for lower limb arthroplasties or is it lack of function? So in other okay. words, would you do this in someone who says, look, my wrist is very stiff, um, you know, based on your results now. So you would do that. But what indication would you prefer? Well, if the, the, if the wrist is very stiff, I will not uh, propose an arthroplasty. As I told you before, uh, uh, bad motion before operation will lead to bad motion after operation. And they will not gain much. No, pain is very important. And pain, of course, that has not be, uh, been successful in, in other treatments. Sure. So very, very clear message. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, just, just to add something, I, I, I totally agree with Michel, and I may add, of course, those patients with both wrists affected, still motion, because we know that if we don't have motion, we won't have any more motion after the, the, the wrist arthroplasty, uh, but still a, a good sagittal um, axis of the wrist, because we know that it's uh, more difficult, and still good extensors. Because, I mean, Guillaume uh, had some cases in which you made a great transfer and it worked, but still good, uh, I mean, good extensors. So th this is also a critical point. Good. So some of these points are um, uh, related to rheumatoid arthritis, the, the bone stock and the extensive tendons and things like that. And we don't have these cases very much anymore. Sure. Mm. I mean, so that brings me very neatly to the next question, which is related to something like the Motec uh, risk no, no. replacement. Uh, the question. I, I, I have to answer the question as well. Um, it's, it's very simple. It's more for rheumatoid patients, as we all three said. If, the, the, if you have still a good alignment of, uh, of, of the wrist, I really prefer at this time to use an Amandis uh, implant because it's safer. You don't have all those risks. If it's uh, uh, subluxated, it's another game. And now we, we still have to look for a good solution for those patients. And, uh, 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 but I, I would probably prefer an arthrodesis and, and, and the very few indications in non-related patients. Yeah. Thank you. And um, I think that takes us neatly to the, the next topic, which was related to, say, something like the MoTeC, which allows a lot of degrees of freedom. Uh, and so if you were to do something like the MoTeC risk replacement, which has found uh, a huge market share, particularly in the Far East, Australia, uh, you would find that they would fail. So I think that's a very important take home message because it tends to be more loser within rheumatoid patients. So you'd probably prefer something like the Remotion and the Universal. Now, one of the things we found um, is that the survivorship and our published results of 110 patients at uh, seven years was 94%. And when I looked at all our risk replacements three years later, so at the 10-year point, our survivorship dropped down to 82. And similar to what you found, uh, we found a huge amount of osteolysis. So I think there's a paper that's about to be published with, within the, the, the hand journal uh, and what is slightly troubling is that we still don't know what causes these particular the particulate matter that causes the resorption and catastrophic loosening. And I was just wondering whether there are any design changes that maybe um, uh, you're working on in France, or whether Michelle you're working on with, for, for the wrist replacement, particularly with um, with the remotion that could perhaps change that um, that that loosening that that tends to occur because we don't don't really still know the reason. Isn't it? We we thank you for this very important question. We we are working on a, a double motion uh, implants actually. Mm. Yeah. So when you speak, uh, the problem is still 
the the um, loosening of the distal component, the carpal component, and and uh, that fixation should be improved in some way. Sometimes I think it is it's it's maybe clever like the the motic did to return to fixation in the um, uh, metacarpals, but that needs. Uh, a fusion of the uh, CMC joints, of course, and it doesn't solve all problems. Um, another solution has been used in the freedom that is using locking screws instead of the screws that the, were in the Universal 2 and in the Remotion, screws that actually were loose um, in the carpal plate. Now, it's that I think that is wise, but how much uh, that will uh, so, uh, bring solutions, I don't know. Time must show that. Yes. So we've got just one more minute left. So I thought we'd come to the uh, million dollar question, quite literally, which is the problems we're having in Europe and UK and uh, you know mainland Europe with MDR. That's the, the new regulations that have been imposed upon joint replacements. And uh, certainly within the UK, they've withdrawn the freedom uh, we lost the Universal 2 10 years ago, and now we are left with the MoTeC with that troubling paper that Ole has now published saying that metal on metal should not be used anymore. Uh, and I was very pleased to see both of you commenting on the use of uh, bespoke prostheses, the, the role of custom-made prostheses, because that is probably going to be how we will be able to get these prostheses in. And wh what strategies have you all employed? Has this affected you within Europe? Is this something which... Um, you have managed to get around. Are these prostheses still available freely? Um, because it will have an impact on what happens in the Far East as well. It's a really concerning issue. Thank you for pointing this out uh, uh, also. Um, this is the influence of the industry on what we are able to provide to our patients. For example, for the other head, uh, the, the SBI disappeared. Uh, there is only the um, KLM uh, uh, left, and, uh, and, and the, if you don't have any implant, it's difficult to uh, good to put together indications for uh, patients. So there is, we don't have the solution. It's more economic and uh, politic than uh, medical. Yes. yes. Thank you very much, Charles. Uh, I think uh, we, there's going to be a uh, and this uh, discussion uh, with this very interesting topics and with the real expert, the real expert uh, here. So um, I think I, we have to, I, I think that we have to end the section and would, uh, may I invite uh, the three speakers to try to uh, answer the questions uh, in the Q&A boxes uh, of, the, of the, um, the, meet, the meeting and then uh, so that we can save the time uh, for the next sections. Thank you very much. Uh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In the, yeah, in, in the real meet, yeah, physical meetings. Thank you very yes. much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah, thank Have you. a good day. Dr. <coughs> Dr. Erica, over to you. So we would like to welcome uh, Dr. Ken Li Pua as the moderator of the second session. Uh, Dr. Ken Li Pua, your, the channel is yours. Okay. Hey. Hi, guys. My name, hi, 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 my name is Ken. I'm an orthopedic surgeon practicing at Singapore General Hospital. I specialize in, in, in shoulder and elbow surgery. Um, I wish to thank the organizers for for in for in for inviting me. Yeah, I'm still at work. Um, I'm going to introduce the the first speaker, uh, who is who is, uh, who is Dr. Clara Wong. Uh, Dr. Wong's a consultant at the Chinese University of Hong Kong Medical Center. She teaches actively at Prince of Wales Hospital and serves as an associate professor at CUHK, and she's been there since 2018. Uh, Clinical expertise is in the hand, wrist, elbow, and microsurgery, which is heavily reflected by her productive publication in this field. So we we will be we'll be playing a video from Clara uh, from here onwards, and we will take questions at the end. Mm -hmm.
Now, can we play the video again with the sound? Would like to know more about the elbow arthritis. Elbow arthritis can be classified as primary or secondary. Primary arthritis should be related to genetic susceptibility, aging, excessive loading, repeated microtrauma, and ligamentous laxity. Secondary arthritis could be related to previous traumatic events such as fracture or dislocation, post-traumatic elbow joint malalignment, dysplasia, osteochondritis desiccant. No matter is primary or secondary, patients experience mechanical pain and stiffness and sometimes rest pain which is related to inflammatory state. Pain can be at mid-range which is related to onohumeral osteochondrolations or presence of loose bodies. It can also be classically at the end range, which is related to the osteophytes at the coronary process and coronary fossa impinging onto each other, causing anterior elbow pain at maximum elbow flexion, and osteophytes at the olecranoid fossa and olecranoid tip impinging onto each other, causing posterior elbow pain at maximum elbow extension. Arthroscopy is excellent in handling the impingement pain by removing the impinging osteophytes it also helps to remove the synovitis and handle the secondary inflammatory pain. It also helps to remove the loose bodies to handle the mechanical pain and discomfort. But for the mid-range pain resulted from the large osteochondrolations, it doesn't help. Elbow stiffness is resulted not only from those impinging osteophytes blocking motion, but also the marginal osteophytes along the articular margins and causing articular mild incongruity. It is also resulted from secondary capsular hypertrophy and contracture. Arthroscopy is, is effective in removing this impinging osteophyte and remove or release the thickened capsule to improve the range. But for the marginal osteophytes and joint incongruity, it doesn't help. Besides pain and stiffness, symptomatic ulnar neuropathy happens in 25-55% to 55 of the patients with elbow osteoarthritis. Outer nerve surgery is indicated during the arthroscopic surgery. Therefore, in order to achieve the best result from arthroscopic surgery in elbow or sephritis, accurate and proper preoperative assessment is important. Detailed history, especially the nature of the pain, locking symptoms, is necessary. Accurate physical examination for any impingement tenderness Feeling the motion endpoint is also necessary. For soft endpoint, consideration of capsulectomy is higher. If the endpoint is firm, osteophyte excision and capsulectomy should be adequate. Examination of the outer nerve for any sense removal deficits is important. Any nerve thickening has to be recorded, and the site of tenderness has to be accurate. Realistic goals should also be addressed to the patient, especially patients with articular incongruity. This is a 45-year-old man, a Thai boxing player, and now with elbow fraction contracture about 40, 30 degrees, with a postlateral elbow pain, and has difficulty to give a forceful punch and wanted to have full elbow extension. This is his CD scan. CD scan is helpful to let us know where are the we found that they are over the posterior aspect of the lateral corn dial and the lateral aspect of the olecrine. The patient underwent an elbow arthroscopy, removed the synovitis, and removed that osteophytes.
The patient underwent an elbow arthroscopy, removed the synovitis, and removed that osteophytes. And inside operation theater, he achieved full range of motion. This is his condition on the same day afternoon with good range of motion. This is his condition five days after the operation and after the brachial plexus catheter removal, he achieved full range of motion. This is his condition one year later and he was very happy and he could enjoy painless full punching in doing boxing and he didn't experience any pain in doing sports. This is another gentleman, a 50-something year old man, complaining elbow pain. This CT scan is showing that it's hypertrophic osteoporosis. He had the elbow limited range of motion. The under anesthesia, the passive range of motion was 35 to 90 degrees. And after arthroscopic osteocapsular arthroplasty, he achieved full range of motion. This is his condition one day after the operation, showing good range of motion. This is his condition four days after the operation. He could achieve good active range of motion. This is his condition, and you found that he's very motivated and active in doing exercise in the bed. In 2009 and 2013, and 44 patients the one elbow of Arthroscopic release with a fall off for eight years time, and the preoperative range of motion was seventy one degrees and improved to one hundred twenty eight degrees, and the elbow flexion contracture improved from thirty five degrees to four degrees. All patients have improvement in pain with the average improvement from five point six to zero point eight over ten. The elbow function assessment score also improved from fifty eight to ninety two point nine, and the patient satisfaction score was eight point two over ten. This is an example of a patient underwent the elbow arthroscopic surgery, and you found that very good post-operative range could be achieved. This is another person who had a surgery, and he could achieve good, op good range of motion soon after the operation. First, we have to minimize the trauma from the surgery. We can't make any injury to the nerve, even the cutaneous nerve. And we also have to minimize the swelling of the surgery. We have to know the anatomy and the surgical technique well. We have to know the anatomy of where are the middle cutaneous nerve, forearm, natural cutaneous of arm and the posterior cutaneous nerve of forearm so that they won't be injured. We have to be careful to put the portals. We need to use a knife to cut down to the dermis and use the blunt artery to do the dissection to the subcutaneous layer to retract and push away the cutaneous nerve before putting the trocal cannula. If you want to have a knife to cut through the capsule, still need to do this procedure to dissect away the cutaneous nerve at the subcutaneous layer. For the deeper nerves, including the radial median and also the outer nerve, we have to be familiar with the surface anatomy so that the portal won't hit onto the nerve and be familiar with the relationship of the portal side and the nerve. And the, with a sterile tonicate, the dripping can be easier with bigger operative field exposed so that we can make sure that the anterior side of the elbow is relieved and the nerve won't be pushed close to the capsule. Insufflating the joint with saline is also helpful to push the neurovascular bundle away from the elbow joint. Judicious use of switching stick is helpful. The use of a switching stick to feel the intermuscular septum is helpful so that we can pass the stick anterior to the intermuscular septum and walk the stick along the anterior surface of the condyle. This helps to create a portal track away from those nerves. Expose and release the ulnar nerve is a useful technique to protect the ulnar nerve from inadvertent pressure or traction from any instruments around. 
when creating a new portal, we can use needle to locate the desired portal site, and same, use front artery forceps to create the portal as the outside technique. Or we can use an inside out technique by putting a switching stick puncturing to the desired portal site, then pass the choke cannula through along the switching stick to the opposite portal. Remove the switching stick and the choker cannula can guide the instrument entering the joint. Or we can use the burr. If we use the burr, we remove the burr from the burr cannula, pass the burr cannula along the switching stick and get into the joint before assembling the burr into the burr cannula. These techniques can minimize the risk of nerve injury and prevent the extra conversation. Bending the elbow can create space in the anterior compartment and extending the elbow creates the space in the posterior compartment. The instruments will then be away from the neurovascular bundle. Remember to put the shaver blade away from the capsule side and also stop shaving or burning when encountering any fatty tissue because fat tends to stay with nerves. Besides minimizing trauma from the surgery, we also have to offer on the nerve surgery whenever necessary. Please don't mind spending time on the nerve. It's worthwhile. We can release the ulnar nerve if the position of the ulnar nerve cannot be easily palpable or confirmed preoperatively, or if the patient has the ulnar nerve symptom or sign, or there is a preoperative elbow range of motion less than 90 degrees of flexion. We have to make sure that the release of the ulnar nerve is adequate from all potential compression I will also, middle, also do and offer the middle epicondylectomy if there is ulnar palsy or elbow fraction range less than 70 degrees. But if the ulnar nerve can be identified and be sure not around the surgical site, no ulnar nerve surgery is needed. This is an example of a gentleman with elbow osteoarthrosis and he had previous anterior transposition of the ulnar nerve performed, but the ulnar can be <coughs> easily prepared, so no ulnar nerve exposure is needed. He enjoyed good range of motion after the elbow arthroscopic surgery release. Third, we have to remove the osteophyte adequately. We have to read and remember the orientation and position of the osteophyte and tackle them accordingly. You can put up several representative images next to the arthroscopic monitor for easy reference during the operation. Prominent osteophytes are easy to be identified and blurred. blurred. We can blur to the absence of whitish island or the trim line, which are still part of the osteophytes. We can also check inside arthroscopic view at elbow fraction extension for any residual impingement. Sometimes navigation-assisted osteophyte excision is helpful to confirm complete osteophyte removal. Fourth, capsule surgery. I tend to excise the capsule if it is a traumatic osteoporosis, post-traumatic osteoporosis. If the endpoint is soft, I also tend to excise the capsule to prevent it tearing the motion. <coughs> we can develop a plane anterior to the anterior capsule before peeling or scissoring, and this is safe to the neurovascular bundle. We can put a capsulotomy and capsulectomy procedure as the last part of the surgery to prevent extravasation. Fifth, we need motivated and compliant patients. Counseling the patient before the operation is important. I always told them that operation only helped them for 50%. Another 50% relies on their motivation and compliance. Sixth, we need to offer a proper post-operative we can put up the brachiopressus catheter and infuse the local anesthetic drug through the catheter so that the patient can enjoy relatively painless elbow range of motion. Then the patient know that they need to move the elbow and the motion also help to decrease the swelling and also encourage the hematoma inside the elbow to 
them out. So we also need to insert two drinks, one anterior and one posterior, to encourage the motion that puts the uh, joint hematoma out before removal so that there's no fibrosis uh, formed from the hematoma. We have to keep the drain for three days and remove them when the full passive range of motion could be achieved and start the low load long duration exercise and teach the patient to do the exercise by themselves since day one of after the operation. Sometimes CPM is helpful, especially if the patient can't do the exercise by themselves. We also need to start compression therapy since day one. And start the turnbuckle spleen for passive motion after discharging. Finally, we have to set up and release the goal with the patient. Despite impinging osteophyte being removed, despite the posterior panel MCL being excised, the elbow range of motion is sometimes still limited. It is because of joint incongruency. Marginal <coughs> osteophyte limit the ulnar here mode congruency, and the proximal radial ulnar joint osteophytes and the radial head osteophyte push the radial head anteriorly and affect the radial capsular congruency. So the radial head can impinge onto the uh, distal humerus anterior side at maximum flexion. Without removing the radial head, further flexion couldn't be achieved, but it is not possible. A realistic goal should be delivered to the patient. So in conclusion, arthroscopy is helpful to gain range and relieve the patient's pain. Proper preoperative assessment, surgical technique, appropriate nerve and capsular surgery, good patient education, and meticulous post-operative rehabilitation can easily give happy results. Thank you so much. In Ken, you are muted. Okay. Oh, great. Thanks. Uh, 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 next, next, we will have uh, Dr. Sumin Cha, who's, who's going to talk about the OK procedure as a workhorse. He's a specialized hand and orthopedic surgeon uh, who, who graduated in, from, from the from Chungnam National University College of Medicine, Korea. Uh, and he also has a Master's of Medical Science in Reconstructive Microsurgery from the College of Medicine, Changkung University, Taiwan. He's an associate professor, Department of Orthopedic Surgery, Chungnam National University Hospital, and uh, Chungnam National University School of Medicine, Korea. So we will we will we'll be quite interested to hear about his OK procedure. We'll take questions right uh, at the end of this. Nice to meet you. My name is Sumin Cha from South Korea. Thank you for joining APOA Hand and Upper Extremity webinar. And it's great honor for me to present my topic. Let me introduce my institute. I work in the after South Korea and the city of Daejeon. And the hospital is Chungnam National University Hospital. Here is a building for my orthopedic department building. OK procedure, namely, Autobridge Kashiwagi procedure is originally described by Autobridge. It has been known as house cleaning procedure. The original indication is primary degenerative arthritis. Primary degenerative arthritis, it means also, it has been no event of traumatic. It also very long time, elbow, and repeated 
what? Also, it same meaning of hard usage. But Kashiwagi have modified the more clarify the radiologic features. So, typical primary degenerative arthritis, and there is um, large of osteophyte, marginal spur, traction spur, narrow of coronoid fossa, olecranon fossa, and some narrow joint space with a sclerotic margin. It all show the decreased range of elbow motion. Older than 50 years, male is more common and the radial capital joint region uh, there is a common more than 85%, but this may not be symptomatic. The consensus for the treatment of symptomatic radial capital joint have not yet established. At for 2014, we reported the outcome of okay procedure according to the radio capital joint status at General Hand for the American. We categorized as two groups, the group one with normal radial capital joint and group two with advanced arthritic change in radial capital joint. But after uh, okay procedure for both groups, the overall outcome after surgery was not significantly different. But what's the meaning of radial capital joint arthritis? Many cadaver reports says that uh, even we cannot find the radiographs, the early region begin at the radio capital joint. But the most of the symptoms come from the all humeral region. The most troublesome symptom is the loss of extension and the interrupted thing is the patient usually didn't feel faint during range of motion and the patient felt faint the extension and and the flexion end two point at two point the patient felt faint it was defined as terminal pain at extension and flexion and usually the poor rotation is well preserved. Another important thing is if there have been a lot of symptoms. The OK procedure is now usually used as the same meaning of UHA, Olohumera Arthroplasty. And the modified method by MORI is a little more extensive. There is uh, so many population of Olanor, and he used trapping, and there is additional columnar procedure. Me also sometimes use only simple and mini open all human plasty, but there is no satisfied range of motion requirement. Then me also do have like the columnar procedure. Even though this patient is some a little deformed elbow, but I used the, if like the modified method and open in the medial side. But later I will talk about the open column of procedure through the radial approach. Here, let me summarize my practice and only bony procedure sometimes and minimal incision okay procedure and, and or not all of the compression or transposition. But if there is need more relay, then I add columnar procedure through medial or sometimes lateral. And I always use 18 millimeter strapping. Then make penetration, then I always add coronoid and olecranon tip of the anomaly.
This mother is in the same position of spine and like the surgery and I start the sister posterior margin of the olecterum fossa and I match the positive of the stepping at the distal area. After making a hole, and I can see during flexion the coronoid process, and using my index finger, I can feel uh, if the coronoid process and the spur would block mechanically for the flexion. Then I do osteotomy. At the same time, and uh, extend, then I can feel my second finger, the touch, the tip of olecranon, and also there is some osteophyte, and I do osteonomy, at like the same method. If it is the real surgical motion, I make it for Range of motion is some limited, and but just I making penetration before osteotomy, there is some improved motion you can see. It's like my presentation topic. I do use the OK procedure in also post traumatic arthritis, and because I'm also the traumatic elbow surgeon, if like this, there is some kind of uh, Olecranon pressure dislocation type and very unstable, but the coronary process is very small and there is cognition. So I did do nothing for coronary. I tried to conservative treatment for community coronary process. Then I only fixed Olecranon using the two low profile uh, blade, blocking blade. Then two years later, the union is just uh, satisfied, but there is some enlarged, united coronoid process, and it inhibits the flexion and some kind of extension, probably originated from olecranon. After plate removal and then making her whole, I do osteotomy for the glenoid process through the hole. Before surgery, there is a limitation, extension, and flexion. It means a kind of mechanical block. And during the range of motion, there is no limit, but there is a fixed angle of range of motion. After OK procedure and coronoid osteotomy, there is a little more improvement in flexion. Then I make the incision through the lateral approach for columnar procedure and white is or the head capsule around the radial head and anterior surface and then I put in the through the penetrated hole and if, if my finger tip and I can touch how much or the head capsule should be relieved using scalpel and finally most of capsule is released then additional column of procedure through the letter approach, then we can get much more range of motion. It's 
ชิฟฟายเดฟิดพูดต่อปรตูเลียบรัสและเดมูฟต่อคอร์นอยด์โอฟเซียฟายถ้าเดมูฟต์ This is an interesting case: acute olecular community fracture, but there is already a large osteophyte, and there is a little somewhat degenerative elbow. But I'm afraid that if I just fix the fracture, the already lesion would be more aggravated. So first, I try to fix the fracture and divide some hematoma and soft tissue. After finishing the plating, and I open the distal triceps for all the humeral arthroplasty. I make a pierced stretcher using trepin. Also check. The flexion and extension motion. Then I also do osteotomy for the coronary process. After the surgery and the fracture well at the union and the penetrated hole is also well maintained. I would like to talk about the isolated non-community coronary fracture, and I did my best to precise, perfect reduction, and always check during surgery full range of motion. That we finally can get full range of motion at clinic, even one year later. But. In case of such community f r a g m e n t it is very difficult to fix the maintaining the original congruity. As like this community, and there is some bony defect. Only this area of articulation should wear. Match it to the distal humeral articular cartilage. So I usually put the priority, the maintenance of the original concentric congruity of coronary process against distal humeral articular cartilage. This bone defect is just covered by any kind of bone graft. Now we are learning. Out of time, and it's time to summarize my message. Okay, procedure is one of my favorite option for blocked elbow. What's the blocked elbow? You easily imagine mechanical mechanical origin of elbow pain, and then sub subsequent elbow stiff, regardless primary or post traumatic. Also, you can easily differentiate it mechanical stiff with Or capsular or soft tissue origin stiff. As like my method, if there is definitely mechanical origin, I try to mini open my method using 18 millimeter trepin. If mixed, then I try to mini open OK procedure first, then extend the procedure like Mori. If definitely or purely capsular stiff, I try to. Arthroscopic procedure. When expected improved amount of range of motion after this procedure, or run of manipulation at same time is essential procedure. And also in simple radiograph, you can easily expect the or run of region, sometimes ganglion and or the other thing. Also, chloroid and molecular fracture status is. Potential candidate for the later OK procedure. If fracture in coronoid or lacrimal with already degenerative elbow condition, then try to OK procedure at the same time for fracture surgery. This is my last message for about my topic. 
Well, concentrated reduction in elbow in traumatic condition, I believe the original contour is with a little defect is much better than compressed reduction at fracture without any defect in coronoid process and olecranon against the post-traumatic SIT. For example, if a kind of a pediatric bolagatum fracture and fixed by footrest plate. But in similarly in adults, excessive compressed poles make non-anatomy reduction. Well precise reduction coronoid process and this olecranon congruity is essential for prevention of post-traumatic arthritis in elbow. Thank you for watching my bowling video. Let's go together. Oh, that was that was two fantastic videos, right, Erica? Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. So, uh, we do. If there's a there's a question on the there's a question on the Q and A board from uh, Doctor Eugenio Brito. Uh, in an elderly patient with a prior old history of trauma, presenting with a stiff elbow with a leg consult, how would you differentiate a heterotopic ossification? versus osteoarthritis of the elbow joint. We'll, pro we'll probably post this question to both Clara and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Zoom in. Clara, Clara first. Hello, thank you. Thank you for your question. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, thank yes. you, thank you. So um, for the question that, that how we differentiate a post-traumatic condition that, that's related to post-traumatic arthritis, or is due to heterotopic ossification, sometimes it's not difficult to differentiate from normal X-ray. From the ordinary X-ray, in the X-ray, you can differentiate it, uh, the position and the side of the uh, abnormal new bone. But uh, I think the CT scan is very helpful to, to differentiate. There are indeed uh, three conditions that sometimes may get confused. Sometimes the fracture site may have the uh, new bone form around at the fracture site, but we can't uh, categorize it as a heterotopic ossification or the post-traumatic arthritis. The second condition is that because of the post-traumatic condition with the degeneration or wear and tear of the cartilage, then resulting in the ossified form at the margin of the joint surface, then we are clear that it's related to post-traumatic arthritis. For the heterotopic ossification, it's quite away from that of the fracture site and also away from the margin of the joint surface, then we know that it's related to heterotopic ossification. Sometimes like uh, we encounter patient with a radio head and neck fracture and also the auricular fracture and found that there's new bone form around the distal humerus region that, that uh, is so easy to differentiate uh, which from which in these three conditions from the CD scan. Hmm. Hope that I can answer the question. Yeah, great, cool. Um, that got uh, that 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 was that was a pretty amazing video. The set of videos that you showed uh, for uh, for the uh, for the for the arthroscopic capsular release and the uh, arthroscopic osteocapsule arthroplasty. Got a couple of questions because um, uh, how how long do you keep your patients uh in in the ward and. <laughs> At what, at, what, at what point do you let them go home and how frequently do you see them? Uh, yeah, good question. I, I, I know that I stayed patient in the hospital for much quite longer time when compare that uh, of the patients of a Professor Jason or Jusko. I stayed them in the ward uh, for at least five days and I keep the brachial, brachial presses catheter for about five days, at least five days, sometimes seven days. And uh, I will let them going back home when they can gain full range of motion. And I try to achieve the full range of motion inside the operation theater and make sure that they can maintain the range of motion before they're going back home. I think it's something related to some psychological reason to stay them for that long time to make sure that they can uh, achieve that kind of motion before leaving hospital, before leaving my eyes. So that I have to make sure that when they come back to me in the follow-up, they have to, and also they, there's the responsibility of them to keep that range 
and then when they come back for the follow-up. And uh, for the follow-up frequency, I will ask the patient to come back a week later, and then if the condition is good, I'd also come, ask them to come back another week later. I don't refer the patient for any physiotherapy because I find that the patient themselves is much useful than going to the physiotherapy for the exercise. And also one reason is I found that keeping the elbow cool is very important. If they travel away from home into the physiotherapy, they, at that time, they may already get the elbow inflamed. They cannot, cannot cool it down. So I asked them most of the time they stayed at home for their home exercise frequently, but no need to go to the physiotherapy. This is my approach. I'm not sure whether it's, the, it's a good one. <laughs> Well, you, you, you have very good results to, to support it. So <laughs> we, 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 we're all taking notes here. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, Dr. Su Min, um, okay. hi, uh, any, anything that we need to look out for with the OK procedure? Do, do anything to avoid a heterotopic ossification? Because I can see uh, there's a fair bit of bone that gets stirred up with the trephine. Yeah, I agree. But uh, I usually use the bone wax for uh, minimizing the post-operative bleeding. So, so much amount of bone wax, I envelop around the trapping hole. Then I usually discharge my patient a post-operative three days. Then I call them again at one week later. Then I start the range of machine. CPM, I start a post-operative one week. Then I'm rarely experienced the heterotropic ossification, even though I touch the bone. Well, <laughs> uh, yeah, got it, man. Thanks. The, do do you do do you have the day and night splinting similar to how Clara does it? Uh, after surgery? Yeah, after surgery. Yeah, if the patient has the flexion contracture, then I do surgery. Then I usually three weeks nighttime full extension sprint. But if the patient has controversy, then I make a night sprint for flexion position at the post of three weeks only at night. But the ordinary time in daytime, I ask him. Usually daily activity. Then I do two or three times in a week. I call him in my the physical therapy using CPM machine. One hour, three times in a week. If my post operative cough, but I didn't say I have only 15 minutes. So Next time I have chance, I will talk about my post-operative course also. Yeah, I I think we when we uh when we have our patient in the OR, we we're we're spending that period of time. Uh, but I I think trying to maintain that range of motion is is a real challenge for a lot of us. Uh, cause I, either we don't get the same therapist that we work with, or we worry that the patient runs off, uh, runs off with that extra 15 degrees and doesn't come back again until, until it stiffens up. Uh, Clara, 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 for the benefit of the audience, cause, uh, elbow, elbow arthroscopy is pretty difficult to, uh, to, 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 to do, especially for, for <laughs> someone starting out. Do you have any, uh, any advice on what's the ideal? first case that you want to do as an elbow arthroscopist on your own? Uh, I think uh, if doing the elbow arthroscopy in terms of the arthritis, then I think uh, indeed for elbow osteoarthritis, it's, it, is, um, it is not much easier than that uh, from post-traumatic elbow stiffness because the, the osteoarthrosis with the osteophyte forming not only in a single area, in a wide area, that the bone burrowing can <clears throat> create quite a lot of bleeding inside the elbow joint, then the patient can easily have the post-traumatic post-surgery fibrosis uh, after the operation. Then this may frustrate the surgeon to go for another case. So I think in order to build up the confidence, so it's better to do to work on arthroscopy in the post-traumatic stiffness rather than the uh, primary osteoarthrosis. And now also for the post-traumatic stiffness, better to start 
with some simpler case with no heterotopic ossification and also with just some fibrosis with no articular incongruity, then I think those are easy case. But if you want to pick up some related to osteoarthritis, then maybe related to uh, sports injury would be easier. Just like what the case that I demonstrated is the easy case with only a small area of bony outgrowth, then it's easier for the beginners to uh, try on that small area without too much bleeding from the, uh, from the uh, surgical field. Then uh, hope that uh, they can try on those. And also when doing the surgery, try not to get in a hurry. Try to do one step, step by step, step by step. No need to get it too much hurry. Otherwise, you get too much swollen, injury the capsule, then causing extra fixation, and too much swollen and too difficult to go ahead for the rehabilitation. So this is my small tip for those uh, beginners. I do have some uh, comment, Ken, if I may. Yeah, go ahead, Erica. I think uh, most of our, our audiences are a uh, general orthopedic surgeon or young consultant just st starting. Uh, we have to be uh, we have to take notes that this procedure that demonstrated by Dr. Clara and Dr. Cha is not for severe uh, deformed osteoarthritis. Uh, you have to make sure that you are not your patient is not at the last stage of arthritis which require a prosthetic uh, joint replacement. And uh, for those who are in grade uh, two or one, maybe you can still help them with uh, this procedure, which I really like the uh, arthroscopic procedure. It's a really, how should I say, uh, uh, very uh, futuristic. But uh, on the other hand, okay, procedure is sometimes my workhorse if uh, the body block is very, a prominent and may I ask the two of our speakers regarding the pre-op motions do you have any uh, tips for uh, prognostic factors for a successful surgery in each of your surgery uh, like uh, how bad is the pre-op motion will you go and pick your surgery scope for Clara and okay procedure for Dr. Cha please so maybe I answer first so I think uh, I found that it's not related to the preoperative range of motion. Um, sometimes we find that the CT scans showing not too bad osteophytes, but they have very stiff elbow. And I found that the prognosis is more related to any marginal osteophytes and also um, involving the osteophyte around the radial head and the proximal radial ulnar joint. So if the osteophyte is uh, growing at the margin, and also we found that the radio had already growing to too much a bigger size rather than the normal mushroom size. And there's also osteophyte at the proximal radio on a joint causing the anterior translation of the radio head. Then uh, no matter how adequate you remove the osteophyte, as what I've shown you that uh, even with the um, navigation to confirm that all the abnormal uh, osteophytes has been removed, but the range of motion is still not satisfactory because of the limitation by the marginal osteophytes and also and the radio head osteophytes. So I think uh, the CT scan is a quite good prognostic factor. Yeah, and also another factor is the nerve. Sometimes the patient may have uh, the related to neurogenic uh, stiffness. If the ulnar nerve is not adequately released, sometimes you may encounter a patient after mm -hmm. releasing the elbow, they still have some ulnar nerve symptom. And after repeating, ulnar nerve release, we found that we realized that the first operation for the ulnar nerve is the most important one. So that I reinforce that we need to have adequate release of the ulnar nerve in your first surgery. Mm. Okay. Thank you. As actually, your answer is in uh, Dr. Cha's slides, the radio. I totally so, agree with Clara. Yes. <laughs> she already answered everything. Thank you. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. All right. Thank yeah, uh, yeah. Looks like we've run out of time. Uh, so we will we uh, wish to thank the thank the speakers for taking your Saturday evening off to join us, and we will move on to the next segment. Thanks, Erica. Thanks, thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Erica. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks for the show. Thank you. Hello, do you hear me? 
Yes, loud and clear. Yes. Yes, so uh, we are moving um, to uh, the last session. Uh, it's uh, uh, the shorter session. The topic is brain humor arthritis. I am Noboru Taniguchi as uh, a moderator. I'm a professional chairman of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery, Graduate School of Medical and Dental Science at Kagoshima University, Japan. And the commentator is Buncha. Yeah, I'm Dr. Bansha Chichujit, uh, professor in Thomasat University, Thailand. Okay, thank you for the invitation. Yes, Dr. Noboru. Yes, and uh, in this session we have uh, two presenters. Presenters, the one is uh, uh, Dr. Chen Chu Yu. He's going to talk about surgical treatment for young patients with grain humor osteoarthritis. And as you see, Dr. Zhang Chu Yu went to Northern Western University in USA and graduate school, graduate Korean University Medical School, 1994. And he has done his hospital training at Korea University Medical Center and the military training as a medical officer until 2002. Then, and the fellowship in knee and shoulder also plastic and sports medicine for one year under Dr. Jin Hong An and Dr. Sing Hu Kim. And from then on, he posted the shoulder surgery in AG University Hospital for two years and moved to Samsung Medical Center. And, Sun King Kang University, where he works till now as a professor. During this time, he did one year studying also by mechanical lab in UC Auburn. And the professor Tai Kuri is a famous guy also. They several training fellows to Europe and USA. And uh, yeah, today he's gonna talk about the uh, uh, surgical treatment. Are you ready to talk? Uh, yes. Uh, good. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's an I'm an honor to be here. I have a pre-recorded uh video, so it, it doesn't have lag. So please run that, and then I'll join the Q and A. Okay. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jay Seo. I'm from Seoul, Korea. Uh, thanks for inviting me to this wonderful webinar of the 11th APOA Hand and Upper Limb uh, webinar. My talk would have nothing to disclose for this talk. The etiology of glenohumeral arthritis in young patients as a primary is relatively rare compared to the old person, 21%. Uh, this is one of my patients who's been doing Software for a long time had uh, developed uh, arthritis and uh, did, did one or two surgeries. For a secondary uh, glenar humor arthritis, is usually uh, instability, a fracture of sequelae, or infection uh, conditions after infection. And usually with glenar humor arthritis, occurs 20% in 10 years with dislocation. Uh, in 25 years, it's about 40%, so it's a quite a big number considering their age. Um, this is uh, one of 39-year-old female who did not do surgery and dislocated for 10 years with subluxation. You can see there is uh, arthritis developing. And this is a 41-year-old who had multiple injections with shoulder pain, developed uh, an infection, low-grade infection, with developed arthritis. Another cause of secondary glenohumeral arthritis would be osteonecrosis. Uh, there are many reasons for this. Uh, one of them would be uh, alcoholism and um, uh, diverse disease. This is one of the diverse disease called Cation's disease, who 45 years has been diving for more than 25 years. You can see the AVN. The AVN does not cause glenoid uh, arthritis initially, but uh, eventually, if they develop long enough, they will become uh, glenoid wear. Another iatronic uh, arthritis would be uh, post-surgical, uh, especially rotator cuff repair, uh, glenohumeral articular surface in terms of uh, metal anchors 
and other surgeries. And this is uh, one of the female six to one who did operation in a different hospital uh, two years ago, developed a rapid uh, necrosis. Uh, and of course, if you do uh, over tightening of the joint, uh, whatever the surgery or uh, the ladder J or Bristol procedure with some metals, you can see there's like a uh, 50% uh, uh, arthritis in 24 years. This is one of the rotator cuff repairs we've done and developed uh, arthritis uh, after two or three years uh, um, of the uh, surgery. This is uh, one of my patients who developed uh, arthritis who did uh, ladder J in Bristol uh, in a long time ago from a different hospital uh, who developed arthritis. The main symptom would be night pain, uh, pain at the end of the range, locking and catching, and limitation of motion is usually seen on the physical examination, especially for flexion and external tension. Uh, one of the uh, common classification is used is Simerson of Pietro, uh, depending on the osteophyte of the inferior uh, glenoid uh, humerus, which is called goat beer. Uh, if it's less than three minutes, one. If you can see the joint is destructed, it's grade four. Uh, for glenoid wear, uh, the not only not only uh, glenoid humor arthritis. But the cuff arthropathy is also used as a modified Welsh classification. You can see two types of A, three types of B, and C and D. Of course, there is some little bit of more subject classification of this uh, classification. Uh, so now this is the normal shoulder. If you confront with the patient young, 45 or 50, who comes with this arthritis, What's your option? Of course, most of them are uh, non-operative. It's the first line of choice for active young patients. And the goal is to improve range of motion and strengthen the muscles. And we can do uh, relatively any, as much things that we can do with medication and physical therapy. But however, you know, these young patients are very active and they want to do a lot of stuff. And it's very difficult to just do conservative and and feel not feel very good. So they have higher expectation, they have long life expectancy and their higher activity. Uh, so we do something for their surgical treatment. So and there are two options, joint preserving and joint replacing. So the surgical treatment option, so for this kind of patients, we can do arthroscopic debridement just to clean out and, and to increase the range of motion by releasing the capsule and the intervals. Or we can just do hemi. And we can do hemi with, um, with a Riemann 1 technique, which means to burn out a little bit of the uh, glenoid surface without any uh, uh, arthroplasty. Or we can do some biologic uh, meniscus type uh, implantation. Or we could just do total shoulder, which is the ultimate uh, end we can do. So this is what we can do. Arthroscopic procedure, biologic replacement, joint replacement with without bone tr treatment and total shoulder anatomy. So arthroscopic debridement, which is called CAM. Uh, it's usually indicated with minimal osteophyte and um, subchondral cyst, mechanical symptoms due to loose body, and 20 degree side to side difference in ER and IR. Of course, there are pro and cons for this. Um, and of course, uh, the most favored thing is that uh, the patient is relatively young, so we can have this shot and then you can go if it fails you can still do the arthroplasty however um the outcome is at three years to five years is somewhere between 72 percent to 88 percent survival of the patient uh of this uh not 
this is uh, with uh, without that much of publication. It is considered CAM because it's because because we're doing comprehensive arthroscopic management, and what we do is chondroplasty, synovectomy, loose body removal, microfracture, uh, humeral osteoplasty for the osteophyte, capsule release, maybe actually in a release subacromantic compression and biceps procedure. So these all these could be done at one time, which would might help a little bit better without just without doing the arthroplasty. And from the literature, it looks as if 10 year survival rate is 63%, which is not bad for these young patients. And it's in uh, the indicator for failure would be joint space less than two millimeters, flattened humor head, and abnormal posterior glenoid morphology. So this is 36 year old. It's actually not an OA, it's, an, it's more rheumatoid patients. However, I just want to show you that I did a resurfacing for the left and right CAM procedure for the right. And at 10 years and 11 years, she still has pain on the right side, but she's okay. She has no pain on the left side. And the function is a little bit better on the left side where she had the hemicap. For a biologic replacement, which is very relatively common in knee procedure, the shoulder is somewhere, it's not been really researched. So there are like almost no papers or no research. Uh, we could do a little bit of focal defects on these shoulders also, but there is um, a very limited papers. Uh, you, you all know from the knee experience, the pro cons of this ACI allograph and autograph. Uh, I have no experience with this. Um, as this paper show, this study shows that there's only a lack of evidence in most case reports, and we still are very at the baby stage for this kind of procedure. I have an experience with stem cell. Uh, this is one of our uh, my patients. We did some stem cell procedures. However, uh, the patient did not really do well uh, after two years, so. Up arthroplasty. Um, so, so the next procedure, which was common, was hemi plus glenoid treatment. Uh, just hemi or uh, resurfacing has been a topic nowadays. It's hemi is more preferred. Um, so you can preserve the glenoid. However, uh, it is considered its inferior outcome than a primary TSA because uh, the glenoid portion is still there. And the hemiarthroplasty, the revision rate is 25 to about 30% in about 10 years. Uh, so it's, it's very successful, but high rate of persistent pain, glenoid wear and revision and indicating considering patient's age need is important for this kind of procedure. And of course, uh, one other uh, field is the not why don't we just uh, get rid of the arthritis and you know, preserve the bone stock? Um, and some people think it's technically demanding, but um, uh, there are some papers that are already been done in uh, with ten year follow up. The revision is roughly same with the hemi, so I think it pretty much uh, coincides with the hemi versus uh, resurfacing and. I think it's a little bit more technically demanding, and sometimes if the uh, metathesis or the head portion it has some other pathology, it's better to do hemi instead of resurfacing. So now there are limited work doing glenoid work, which is a biological interpositioning graph using meniscus or atlas tendon or a rim and run technique too big. Uh, procedure that you could be done without doing a, a total arthroplasty. So the interposition using uh, meniscus or some other materials was was somewhat studied, but overall failure rate is 50 to 70 percent. So I think now uh, people are stopped doing this uh, since uh, 2015. The remand run technique is, is by Dr. Matson it has been favorized. The basic concept is to restore the centric glenohumeral articulation to avoid PE wear or com uh, complexity of interposition. 
Um, the basically a rim and run, uh, rim the glenoid to the subchondral bone, make a greater radius of a prosthetic head, and then you can see this fibrocotton tissue covering the glenoid, uh, which sounds very nice idea. The overall revision rate was 25%, so it's kind of roughly coincide with all the other uh, studies. Uh, but I think there are very limited number of, of papers looking at this rim and run technique. And, um, um, I, and it's a high revision rate on Sasperina. So in this paper, it states 2007 is carefully selected, is needed. And finally, the anatomic total shoulder replacement. Uh, overall, the, in all the systematic reviews since 2015, the pain, satisfaction, revision, complication, and everything is roughly favors the total shoulder uh, versus uh, versus hemi. This is a, a multi-center retrospective study that in young patient with primary glenomerular TSA shows better outcome survival and similar survival with HEMI. Uh, and this is the recent uh, systematic review stating that comparing the humoral HEMI with the biological resurfacing, uh, total seems to be the best and the most revision it comes from this biological resurfacing or HEMI. Uh, so the total shoulder in glenohumerus is more favorable function and pain relief compared to the uh, hemiarthroplasty, I think properly done is the best. And concerns in young patient would be duration problems in anatomic total shoulder arthroplasty. Uh, recently, the anatomy for humoral component has become stemless, has been favored to become more stemless. For glenoid component, better fixation than just cementing the like cage, some other uh, metal back has been recently been uh, re um, surged in, in our market to see if they are better. So my results of less than 60 was uh, shown in this, uh, you can see the 61 patient we had, about 80% was secondary and 21 primary. And most of them had some uh, uh, yeah, tragenic or uh, some have, have fracture related. The treatment of the, our series was mostly uh, hemi or total, or some were had in even reverse. And the revision in my was that uh, usually hemi was two out of twenty-eight. Uh, arthroscopic debris had six out of nineteen. So uh, pretty much uh, similar with the literature. In summary. The young age orthoarthritis difficult to treat. Conservative treatment is the first line since long time expectancy in these young patients. For both sides, arthritis anatomic is done uh, best results if done properly compared to the hemi hemi biologic or biologic treatment. Uh, anatomic total shoulder seems to have good results in long time survival. Uh, and the and, and total shoulder hemorrhoid components being shorter, glenoid base plate becoming stronger fixation. Thank you very much. Thank you, JC. Very nice talk. Very informative. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, we're going to discuss uh, uh, at the end of the uh, yeah, both of yeah. two guys' talk. So uh, we will move to the second speaker, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Chung Jang Jin. He's going to talk about the TSA or RSF for patients with grand humerus arthritis. As you see, this is, uh, yes. uh, is this is a uh, CB graduated from School of Medicine, Peking University in 1996. He took a shoulder fellowship with Professor Evan Prattel at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. 2001. He is now an elite shoulder surgeon in China and takes care of shoulder diseases, including trauma, osteoarthritis, vertical disease, and sports injury around shoulder. Dr. Jian published more than 50 peer reviewed articles and several textbooks about shoulder surgery. 
is one of the founders of Chinese Shoulder Elbow Society and is the foreign corresponding member of American Shoulder Elbow Surgeries Sergeant. Yes, yes. So, Dr. Jigan, are you ready to talk? Thank you, Novo. Thank you. And uh, I think that uh, I apologize that I'm on the move on, on a car. So, mm -hmm. maybe you, you can play uh, for the pre recorded the video and then I'll join for live discussion. What do you think? Okay. Please focus on your driving. Yeah. No, 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 I, I, I'm not driving. I'm not driving. Believe me. <laughs> great to, great to okay. see you, Pancha. Okay, great to see you. So let's start. There's no sound. Please check. There's no sound. Good evening. Thank you for the invitation for the exciting event. And it's an honor and pleasure for me to share some of the topics about using total shoulder osteoplasty versus reverse shoulder osteoplasty in glenohumeral osteoarthritis. Now, we definitely know that uh, if a patient that with a shoulder OA and both with uh, rotator cuff deficient, there would no doubt that a, a anatomical uh, shoulder osteoplasty would never work. It will fail uh, due to the, the, the effect we call the rocking horse uh, phenomenon and uh, will cause very soon um, loosening of the uh, glenic component and causing very disastrous outcomes after total shoulder osteoplasty or hemiosteoplasty. So for those uh, shoulder OA with uh, insufficient cuffs, Anatomic uh, shoulder osteoplasty will be a definitely contraindication. So this, these type of patients are not in the range that we, we're going to discuss uh, for this session. And for those uh, patients with uh, severe cuff insufficiency and severe OA, and definitely that um, a reverse shoulder osteoplasty was the, be the best uh, indication and uh, the best solution for this patient, for these group of patients, especially and a senior patient there, and they could achieve uh, very uh, promising and predictable outcomes. Uh, even this is five-year outcome of the patient, and uh, the French uh, Society have a, a 15 years a long-term follow-up showing that uh, using the reverse shoulder osteoplasty uh, with the indication of uh, cuff tear osteopathy, the survivor rate can I expected over 90% at, at about 15 years after surgery. So reversal or osteoplasty was the best solution for these type of patients. But what we want to gonna talk about today is about the osteoarthritis in shoulder with an intact cuff. And sometimes there will be controversial issues or debate about whether we should treat these kind of patients, uh, whether should using the total shoulder osteoplasty or reversal or osteoplasties. And among all the discussion and debates, that the glenoid morphology seems to be very critical for the decision making uh, of treating the shoulder osteoarthritis with intact cuff. And the evaluation of the cuff, although the cuff can be continuity uh, on the MRIs, but sometimes the quality of the cuff are in doubt. Sometimes it seems to be thin on the MRI images or with fat infiltrations of the cup, although there's no cup tear. All these pathologies should be taken into uh, consideration during our decision makings. Now, before we uh, develop a further uh, discussion into this topic, uh, I think that uh, we should uh, have to review this very famous classification of Glenn Ware by Geo Walsh that on the axial plane, on the axial CT scan, it can be divided into five types of uh, glenar wear. And uh, the most controversial and most difficult one would be these two kinds of uh, glenar wear. Uh, we call it type B2 and type C. And type B2, on the upper part of this, you can see that this is a bi biconcave uh, glenoid. Sometimes, most of the time, with uh, posterior subluxations uh, of the humor head. And a type C would be a very retroverted uh, uh, glenoid uh, deformity. 
and the, and most of the most of the time the severe posterior dislocations. These type B two and type C are one of the most challenging case scenario when you use total shoulder arthroplasty to treat uh, shoulder OA with intercuff. cuff. And it is exactly these two type of uh, uh, very severe bone deformity that cause a lot of debate and controversial issues uh, for whether using a total shoulder arthroplasty or reverse shoulder arthroplasty. So if we uh, review the literatures, that this is a very early literature back in 2015 by uh, Mark Franco, one of the uh, uh, the avant-garde of a reverse shoulder arthroplasty in North America. When he uh, reviewed about a, a, uh, a very early 24 consecutive uh, OA patients uh, that uh, uh, treated with a total shoulder arthroplasty, his experience that showed that at midterm follow-up, if you cannot correct the version of the, uh, the, 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 the glenoid, when you're using total shoulder arthroplasty, that would be cause a lot of radiographic loosening problem during the follow-up. So he proposed reverse shoulder osteoplasty. I think he was among the very first surgeons who proposed that to treat these B2 or C glenoid with a severe osteoarthritis with intact cuff better with a reverse shoulder osteoplasty rather than a total shoulder osteoplasty. And later on, this is very uh, uh, famous article by Gio Wars, and actually Gio, uh, was the very first surgeon who clearly showed that using a total shoulder arthroplasty for those B2 glenoid, especially with that, the, 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 the deformed glenoid retroversion greater than 27 degrees and a humor head subluxation is greater than 80% of the whole length, whole width of the glenoid. If you use total shoulder arthroplasty, it will be the very disastrous uh, or very bad outcomes when you use a total shoulder arthroplasty. So at, at year 2013, Gio proposed that for B2 glenoid with very severe retroversion or severe posterior subluxation, he proposed that we better use reverse shoulder arthroplasty to treat these type of patients, even though these patients have a very good cuff showing on the MRIs. So when we have facing this biconcave of very uh, uh, retroverted glenoid, it depends on uh, whether we should ream to a good version or do a bone graft. Uh, it depends on about the bone quality and the bone of the uh, bone amount, how much amount of bone you have. If you ream to a, a, a good version or anatomic version with enough bone mass to accommodate whatever a total glenoid, and it is too uh, short, too short of the, the distance to accommodate the, whatever the, the, the pegs or, or the, uh, the, the, the columns of the base plates, then you should consider a bone graft for these kind of patients. And for the recent 10 or 15 years, an, an augmented, for total shoulder osteoplasty, an augmented uh, a glenoid uh, prosthesis uh, was proposed uh, for the clinical use. And the first generation seems a little bit rough, and the early experience seems not that satisfactory. But the, the newly designed seems to a, a big improvement for treating such a very severe deformity of the gland. And we'll come back to that in a few minutes. So for these augmented options for B2 glenoid, the biconcave glenoids, and uh, quite a bit of surgeons, they also have a biomechanical studies like this one. He showed that compare the uh, the augmented uh, total shoulder osteoplasty with the uh, the augmented uh, 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 glenoid prosthesis compared with the reverse shoulder osteoplasty. And they found that if sufficient bone stock is available, if you can correct the retroversion pretty good, the posterior augmented glenoid seemed to be suitable uh, the treatment as for this very uh, complex biconcave uh, 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 glenoid. And interestingly, uh, you can see this uh, biomechanical study also have the name of Gio Walsh, who is the very first strong opponent 
uh, for using a total solar arthroplasty for this uh, type B2 glenoid patient. It's pretty interesting. And you can see how Geo, this is the masters of solar arthroplasty in the whole world. And you can see the transitions, how he evolves from 2013 for using a proposing reverse solar arthroplasty and slowly into that augmented uh, uh, total uh, solar arthroplasty. This is another uh, study by by the Mayo group who studied that the using anatomic total solar arthroplasty with posterior capsular plication for treating this uh, uh, B2OC uh, biconcave glenoids with posterior subluxations. And they have uh, a comparable uh, results when using a total solar arthroplasty and posterior uh, capsular plication with the reverse solar arthroplasties in the biconclave gates. And, uh, but they found that the, the total solar arthroplasty leads more complications while compared with the, the reverse. So there tend to be that inclining to the reverse solar arthroplasty for less complication afterwards. I have very little experience on this one. I tried one or two in my uh, whole career and, and I found it's very controversial and difficult to do the plication because when I uh, replace the uh, the glenoid, I have to reset all the uh, labrum around the glenoid. But when you use the posterior pro plication, the posterior release should be limited because you need a, a relatively tight posterior cap capsule to hold on to prevent that postoperative sub subluxation of your humor head. So I have little, very little experience on that. And for me, that is not an easy surgery. This is by Jay Keener. He also compared with the clinical outcome of uh, anatomic total and reverse. He found, you know, no, very, not, not much difference with these two groups. He's saying that both works. And in recent years, uh, there are some authors who evaluate the cost effective or the value analysis of total and reverse. So this is a 252 total shoulder that was matched with the 63 reverse shoulder arthroplasty. And they found they have similar outcomes and value when you use uh, managed glenoid osteoarthritis with intercuff. That means even you count the loosening or complications or whatever, in total, the value analysis, analysis showed that they're pretty similar. And this is the last year in JBJS uh, by JP Warner Group who performed the treatment that uh, the compare also the, uh, the anatomic and reverse shoulder arthroplasty with uh, a, a, a augmented glenoid. In the short term, uh, follow up, they found similar effect, but they found that the total shoulder arthroplasty have a relatively better range of motion compared with reverse, but that was only a two year post op follow up. They said they, they need a longer follow up for that, for that comparison. And this is a, a recent in 2022 also comparing a, a modern design of a, a augmented uh, uh, a glenoid in the total shoulder arthroplasty with a two years follow up. And they compared this with the, a, 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 a reverse shoulder arthroplasty and they found that there's no difference. They all have the same complication rate, the, the similar range of motion and similar uh, successful rate. So they think that there was the augmented uh, uh, to, uh, a glenoid in a total shoulder arthroplasty, they have similar outcome with the reverse shoulder arthroplasty. And this is what I said. Interestingly, GeoWash also is part of this uh, study. So that means that this master is also, uh, there will be a little bit transition in their ideas by the evidence or the newly designs of the, uh, the new processes. So they change from their uh, uh, a, 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 a earlier thoughts. Uh, of that B2 conclave or biconclave glenoid. And uh, for this very complicated uh, uh, glenoid defects, I think whatever a total solar arthroplasty or reverse solar arthroplasty, the future uh, for a very exact preoperative planning or even PSI or even uh, medical robots who assisting us to evaluate or to correct the deformity I think this is the future and this is very important to improve our treatment uh, uh, efficacy and to improve our, the outcomes after surgery would be very, very important in the future for us. So about uh, treating uh, shoulder OA patients with intact cuff, 
Uh, whether we should use total solar arthroplasty or reverse solar arthroplasty, I think I cannot give you a very black and white uh, conclusion to you tonight. And I think that uh, when you do the decision making on such kind of patient, you should consider one, number one, the pathology. And uh, that means that you should evaluate precisely about the uh, not only about the, the glenoid uh, deformity, but also the uh, the status of the cuff, the fat infiltration, the quality, and all pathology should be should be in, take into consideration and in your decision making. And second, you should evaluate the patient, and you should evaluate the patient activity level, the life expectancy, and patient expectation also. So for those very senior patients. They may just, they have very little, uh, uh requests on, on sports or any heavy labor. They just want daily work and they don't want, they want this surgery on the shoulder will be the last surgery on their shoulders and they do not want any chance for revision. So even though that they have similar effect with total and reverse, maybe you can choose a reverse over the total for less, you know, uh, uh, less uh, complication rate or or whatever so the patient characteristics should also be taken into consideration and lastly the surgeons the one who have we have, uh, who have the scarpos also count in the decision making the surgery volume does matter if you're very familiar with reverse or osteoplasty like in for me or uh, quite a bit of surgery in 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 in, in, in the northeast asia that we are very comfortable with reverse and we do very little, like me, we're doing very little total shoulder osteoplasty uh, compared with reverse. I feel much more comfortable with reverse. I would definitely choose reverse. And this vice versa, if you are very comfortable with total shoulder osteoplasty and you can do it the same way, whatever, you just pick the most comfortable way, comfortable way you are easily or you can live with for their patient and doing the best for your patient. So in summary, I think both total shoulder osteoplasty and reverse shoulder osteoplasty nowadays, the modern design, they work well in treating shoulder away with intercuff. And when we're facing a B2 and C clock glenoid, the evaluation of glenoid deformity is very critical. We should do a very thorough evaluation and preoperative planning uh, of these kind of patients before uh, we're doing surgery, either we do a total or do a reverse. And uh, I think in, for the future, we need high level evidence and longer follow up time and a, a larger case series to to further prove that these two kind of arthroplasties have similar outcomes or what they one is better than the other. That was uh, we need a multi center or a very a, a better uh, level, a better a higher level evidence to prove that. And most of all, we need to individualize our treatment for those kind of patients, taking into the pathology, uh, the patient characteristic, and the surgeon ourselves into consideration to form a best uh, treatment protocol for these certain patients. And once again, thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Xun Jian Jiang. Professor Xun Yang, you have a very nice talk. Dr. Naboru, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In Japan, uh, the gui guideline by uh, Japanese Shoulder Associ uh, Society uh, says that uh, only uh, cuff tear arthropathy and the massive load the cuff tear is uh, the indication for reverse shoulder arthroplasty. So uh, we don't usually use uh, uh, total shoulder arthroplasty for, for the patient who has an uh, intact cuff. Yeah, so it's a very interesting talk. Yeah, thank you. So there's some question from the audience. Do you use the uh, PRP injections or H injection before you jump in to do any surgery? Jun Yang and Jesse, how you do conservative treatment in OA shoulder in the young? Um, for, for JC, um, sorry, I thought this meeting was until 8.15, so I'm moving right now. I'm very noisy. 
Um, sorry for this. Oh. I have a dinner dinner meeting, so just bear bear with me. Um, actually, drink actually drinking meeting, but um, um, for me, okay. I do I, I do conservative as much as possible, and uh, yes, and um, I just for the young patients. I mean, they they have a long life, so I mean, I don't want to put arthroplasty at the very beginning. So I try to do everything. I think arthroscopic Freeman, I've tried them quite a lot. Uh, works for some, doesn't work for some others. Uh, uh, so I, I think that's one way, but I try to do conservative as much as possible. Okay. How about you, Nyan? Yeah, similar here. I mean, uh, osteoarthritis in young patients is very, very hard to treat because uh, yes. if, that, if the destruction of the uh, uh, Glenn Humber joint is very prominent, now, now, I have no doubt I will go, go into a total shoulder replacement for these kind of patients. But if the, the osteoarthritis destruction of the joint is not that severe, that is the pain. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, but even if I try some of the uh, uh, osteoscopic uh, uh, debridement, bring out, uh, taking out all the yes. burrs, whatever, on, on the humor side or the glenoid side, and quite a bit of pain, you still have the agony after surgery. The pain is not going away. And uh, I don't believe okay. PRP because I don't have the hard evidence. There's no really high level evidence showing that the PRP really works for the glenoid humor joint and even for, mm -hmm. for micro fractures. So, so in a way that um, if you're not, my, my rationale, my philosophy is that if you're not sure about the treatment that you brought to your patient, it is rather to stay yeah. conservative compared with to radical okay. to their patients. So every time, you know, I, I, I have a controversial issue on that, I would take it back to me, you know, although I'm over 50, I'm still young, right? I'm a younger patient. And if I have that situation, <laughs> what would I do? I mean, so most of the time- I'm You don't really look young, I, 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 I would do nothing, okay? I take pill, I can take medicines and uh, do some therapy and things, and I wait. And if okay. that gland or uh, humor gland or, uh, destruction is so severe, I will go directly in, in, into total shoulder arthroplasty. So now, what happens if your shoulder hurts a lot? You can't sleep. Oh, I, I, I go to Bencha. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, the stem cell I, that I'll I just... Take, I'll take time aside. I'll take time or something. Okay. Time. That would help a lot. Yes. Uh, so one, one question from the audience about the age limitation, because you know that uh, we are would learn that the reverse, we choose for the elder patients like 70 years uh, shoulder replacement. You didn't mention about the biologically surfacing rip and run. Yeah, what do you think? You have any age limitation for the reverse arthroplasty? That's a question for me or for JC? What of you? Raymond Ron, I... Yeah. Uh -huh. Shunya, go yeah. first. Yeah. Um, younger patient, uh, you know, I have no experience on Raymond Run, but clearly yeah. JC also told about us that uh, for, for recent about 10 years uh, 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 publications on, in the literature, there's clearly evidence show that the Raymond Run never works. And yeah. only, I think only Frederick Martin showed some uh, short to mid midterm results showing a little bit good. But if you have a longer re a longer follow up, especially because we're treating younger patients, right? And we supposed to have longer follow up. So after ten years, yeah. eight to ten years, the revision rate for Riemann runs is really really get high. And also the deformity mm -hmm. causing by the Riemann run sometimes can be severe. So the revision of yeah. a Riemann run might be, I mean, might be more difficult than a primary one. So I would not opt for, for Riemann run and uh, it's, it's not a good choice. If the patient has really severe osteoarthritis that need an arthroplasty, I'll go once again directly to total shoulder arthroplasty. Okay. No biologically surfacing also, right? No. I have very terrible. Just allograft, I have five cases like 10 years ago. Five cases. I do allograft menisco and I, 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 I do the rain of fixation like Putting a very, it's a beautiful surgery, believe me. You do a hemi, yeah. then you do a biological, and it sucks. It sucks after like just six months. The joint is yes. really narrow, and the patient is uh -huh. painful. So I don't okay. have a, a case theory, 
But after I tried five to six cases 10 years ago, I stopped because it never okay. worked for me. Not in my hand. Jesse, you agree? Yeah, yeah, well, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't do one single case, so I don't, I mean, I, don't, I can't comment on biologic stuff, but all the literature reviews, which is not many, shows mm -hmm. that it fails 50 to 70% within one or two years. So I think we already have the results, so I'm not, I'm not going to try it. Um, I think maybe women run, uh, this is a Matsen's group, and they, they did a lot of cases, so... Um, in those series, they said it's good. I mean, we could try it, but uh, I think other than than Martin's group, uh, there's not many people who really try this because it's you're reaming out the uh, bone and then making it uh, a, a another different surface. But uh, I think a lot of people are just comfortable with total shoulders in these in this situation. And regarding the PRP, Korea, you cannot use it because it's not insured. So no experience in mm -hmm. OA. OA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about in Japan, Dr. Noboru, PRP? Uh, yeah, um, we're going to use that only for knee, not shoulder. Yeah. We, uh, mm -hmm. But uh, uh, in that case, uh, maybe uh, subacromial uh, birth injection? Might be uh, available, but uh, yeah. we know that uh, there is no evidence that still controversy. So uh, it's in Japan. It's very very uh, expensive, and uh, yeah. it's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, same in China. Uh, same your own money is <laughs> your own money is expensive. Yeah, no cost. So, very <laughs> not, not so popular <laughs> in Japan. Yeah, only yeah. a couple of syringes and centrifuges. And it cost about a tenth yeah. of one thousand US dollars or even fifteen hundred US dollars. That's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. So Shunyan, you your talk is interesting about the B2 green oil. Right now, the trend is toward the augmentation of the green oil, right? Not reverse anymore. Right? I, I would not say that. I mean, I would not say that. Yeah. You know, um, Actually, uh, you know, first in 2012 and 2016, when was found out that the total is pretty have a pretty high complication rate for the B2 or C granulate, yes. so he opted for, for reverse. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in the North Americans, all the arthroplastic giants, they started with total. They, they're about five to ten years behind the Europeans about the, on the reverse. Mm -hmm. So they got enamored with the total. So they, they, they try to mm -hmm. find what, because they, they are, as I said on, on my uh, last slides, what kind of surgery you're very comfortable with. These guys yeah. are doing about 20 years with total. They have a lot of experience on that. So they're comfortable with the total. Yeah. But with, with the newly designed augmented uh, glandular uh, prosthesis, they can mm -hmm. match their results now comparable with the reverse. So they come back to the total because they're, they're familiar with it. They're, they're good at it. So I would now say that one is better than the other. What I would say that the now short to midterm results show if you're doing right with a augmented total total arthroplasty, you're supposed to have the similar result which is reverse. It depends on what kind of patient you're treating with or what kind of surgery you are. As for me, I do about two total a year for the past 20 years. I think it's very true for Korean shoulder, shoulder surgeon and the Japan, Japanese shoulder surgeon. In, in Asia, we have very little osteoarthritis patients presented in our clinical practice. So we're not, you know, I'm not a, a, a very a, a master head on total, but I do a, quite a bit of bunch of uh, reversal arthroplasty for the past 10 years for the cost of capital fractures or even fractures. So I feel comfortable mm -hmm. with reverse. And my patient, 75 okay. years old, with the severe osteoarthritis, they said, I don't need another surgery on my shoulder. So just get it done. And I do not need like revisions. So I'm comfortable with reverse. And I think reverse have a lower complication mm -hmm. rather than total because yeah. our, our, our life expectancy is increasing for every country. The you know, patient yeah. may live up to 100 years, right? 95 mm -hmm. is common. You replace the total yeah. at 75, 20 years later. What happened? You got to pay for you know, like a failed total. You do a reverse on a, okay. a, a 95. So my rationale is 
if you want me to do it, I, I'm comfortable with reverse. And I think, you know, if you have a limited demand of your shoulder, not a very, you don't play tennis every day or you don't okay. do a lot of labor work, I would go to a reverse yeah. because I'm comfortable with it. And the result is similar to total. So, so Chunyan, what, what is the youngest happen? patient? Yunyan, Chunyan is the youngest patient you do reverse. Because we're concerning about the age and also the right. longevity right. of the reverse. Yeah. I would any concern be very careful. about that. Yeah, I don't have an absolute. The youngest I did, a reverse, is a very big mm -hmm. uh, dislocation, has five surgeries. He is 25. I do a reverse on him. Wow. But that was a very exceptional. I would only say that I would be very, yeah. very careful when I do a yeah. reverse on a patient under 65 years old with intact cuff. Mm -hmm. That's my point. Yeah. I mean, if it is under 65, a good cuff, I'll opt to for a total. But he got an irreparable uh, cuff, cuff state is not that good or a very thin tendon. You know, even though there's no tear, but a very thin tendon with a, a very severe uh, uh, fatty infiltrations that I will, you know, more apt mm. to, to reverse or Okay, thank you. So, Jesse, how, how about you? Uh, for the V2 Greeno, are you agree with Chunyan? Reverse? Uh, uh, augmentation? Well, this is, a, this is a big, big debate. And I think we agree that under 65 or maybe even 70, we could do with the good cuff, we could do total. Maybe 70 is controversial, but I think it's the age. When it goes to 75 and 80, with I even see 80 year old who has relatively good cuff with um, with arthritis only. So this is the debate I think we should talk about. You know, John Sperling, or was it John Sperling, or someone very famous U.S. surgeon? His mother-in-law, or it was his mother, 83, told me that he did total because he had a relatively good cuff. So I think, I think it's still an ongoing debate. 75 year older with OA with good cuff. But I think we're out of mm -hmm. time, right? Erica, Erica keeps okay. showing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. Face. All right. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you so much. Have fun, Jay Z. Thank fun. you, hey, Chunya. Good to see you, Chunya. Good to see you all. We have, we have thank the noble for the invitation. Thank you, noble. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. See you back. Back to you. Yes. See you. Uh, thank you for all shoulder panelists. It was a very lively discussion. I enjoy every moment. And here we come to announce the next masterclass webinar. The topic is shoulder. So we will see you guys on 25th of march so we will have uh, giants of sur shoulder surgeon who will talk about all revision shoulder surgery from rotator cuff to total shoulder arthroplasty i hope to, uh, every audience can join us in this very interesting masterclass session please stay tuned to our social media for fu a future announcement okay please welcome uh, dr margaret Falk for the closing remarks so um, thank you everyone for um, staying or for the two, for the over two and a half hours here to listen to our webinar. It's been a very fruitful um, discussion, and I'm sure that um, you guys. I hope that you guys have learned um, a lot, and as well as getting inspirations from all our expert panelists. So we know more about the the upper limb um, joint arthritis. Um, so, um, as Erica was saying, um, that we will be having a next webinar on shoulder muscle health, but that's not all. We are planning to have a few more webinars um, at the, over this year. As well as that, we are also planning to have a face-to-face -face meeting, if possible, either this year or next year. But stay tuned to our social media, as Erica was saying, because there will be further announcement. So, without further ado, thank you all for, um, for joining. And thank you all our experts and um, have a good weekend and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So let's get rid of the uh, online things. Let's meet face to face, you know? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we got so much for the online yeah. thing. We, we got fit. Inho, good to right. see you, Inho. You look great. You look great, Inho. Thank you, Inho. Thank you, Inho. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye. Have a good weekend. Bye bye.
Bye. Bye. Have a great weekend. Bye. Thanks. Bye. See you next time. Recording stopped.